Hey guys, my name is Kasper Damsvalu. Uh, I'm from Studio Zone, the video game studio that brought you Disco Elysium and Disco Elysium Final Cut. And uh, I do concept art and uh, level design for Disco. And uh, I'm here with Alexander Rostov. Uh, that's me. I'm Alexander Rostov. Uh, I'm the art director on uh, Disco Elysium. And, and uh, today we're going to be looking at some. Um, uh, character art and some icon art and kind of talking a little bit about about our thoughts and stuff. I'd like to add that this is this is not a uh, lecture video. This is more like time travel where we'll be looking at art from the past and uh, and yeah, giving you our thoughts about it. So what we're looking at is a random selection of, of some of the characters from uh, from Disco Elysium. And I think around half of these are the ones that uh, I worked on and, and the others are that uh, you worked on, Rostov. It's really, really weird to look at stuff from like three and some of these like four years ago. Um, yeah, it's interesting to see just how different uh, all the concepts are also in sort of like their, um, uh, what do you call it, like um, gaggedy, it's like style and the way they're done. Mm -hmm. uh, especially uh, right uh, seeing sort of like uh, Lena here between uh, uh, the, the net picker and, uh, and the washerwoman, uh, which were done by, by you and then uh, Elena was like very much done by like uh, one of my characters done very much in sort of like shorthand and uh... yeah this one's Lena uh -huh. <laughs> and then other characters are almost drawn in like a comic booky kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, I, I think it also had to do with the fact that uh, with some of the characters we were desperately trying to tell a story and it was in in a sort of different. I don't even know, like a development phase of, of the game. And with some of them, it was like slightly more streamlined. We already knew what we were sort of doing. So it was just trying to figure out some kind of shape language or something like that. And then just going into development. Mm -hmm. I think somewhere along the line, I also sort of like figured out the Photoshop brushes, which, which really worked uh, super well for me. And I, I figured out like a and a very streamlined kind of like uh, fast and optimal uh, way to make characters mm -hmm. or just to draw them and, and to, to paint and color them and stuff and Lena is one of the first characters uh, made so uh, yeah I'm just like looking at the concept and it's just uh, it's it's almost um, like cheating how much in shorthand and the undetailed that uh, my character concept is mm -hmm. it's just that leaves so much up for, for like the, the portrait and, and what the writers can like do with this character and very little of it is like sort of embedded into the sketch, but other characters are um, like much more uh, refined and then already thought through within this concept phase. Mm -hmm. And I guess like um, carry a much more loaded and potent uh, like information package uh, or signal with the writers to, to mm -hmm. base that on like their understanding of the character. Or of them. Mm -hmm. I mean. I, I don't know how it was for you. Like for, for me, the the different characters, um, like for the characters, we always worked together with artists. So <laughs> artists, writers. Um, so writers would come to us with with a brief or with an assignment. It's like we have this kind of character, and you know, they should look something like this or that. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it was different for you. You worked on more characters than I did. Uh, so, so like, mm -hmm. what I mean by that is that the characters were in um, very different stages of finish for the writers themselves. So sometimes it was like, I need some kind of imagery to, you know, write their descriptions or something. And, and at other times you had like a finished character that needed art that would sort of characterize them in the best way. Yeah, yeah, it was like, uh, it was like, the, the process uh, wasn't quite like locked down or there wasn't like a specific ritual mm -hmm. through which all of these characters would be created. 
uh, which I think worked to our advantage. It's sort of like had a more, I don't know, playful aspect to it. I mean, I think possibly like um, gave the chance to sort of like for artists to put more into certain characters and, and uh, for other characters they were more sort of like writer driven. Mm -hmm. uh, probably get like better variety and a more interesting uh, cast of, of characters this way, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it really worked in our favor. And I, I think uh, this guy, Roy, I think that, that was the most structured by the book character design that that I, I saw from from the side. And I think it was because it was made uh, like you had to do a blog post about it. So it's like you saved all the little steps and the communication between the artists and going back and forth. I think there are like, I don't know, 10 different variations of like glasses and like vests and haircuts and like stuff, stuff like that. Yeah, we, we were really doing a performance uh, trying to go out with uh, this character. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, pretending that we are video game designers. It's like, yeah, yeah, let's show the world we know what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, I've seen like, you know, post mortems and stuff where the two characters like that, it's all very, very professional. Mm -hmm. But yeah, for me, I I don't remember which came first. Was it, was it Rene and Gaston? Rene is this guy, Gaston's this guy, or was it Netpicker? Um, but here you can see like, like with, with all of my things, like there's no consistent style or anything like that. Like I, 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 I did concepts when I think when you were busy with, with something else and, and the writer needed something ASAP. Um, so, but yeah, like with, with Rene, for example, like designing the uniform. That was that was the longest process of of the whole thing. I think Gaston was just like his his yeah. character is is like a caricature almost. <laughs> yeah, Gaston is you know that French old dude. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, with Rene, uh, Rene's character and, and a few of the other characters as well uh, come like encumbered with this. Um, you're not just designing a character; you also have to like design like so. Yeah, what what was the uniform of of the uh, of mm -hmm. the Military for the suzerain and, and uh, the sort of monarchy or revolution, and I say uh, a much more involved sort of like design process when you're doing like this world building. Uh, yeah, world building. <laughs> world building, the magic word. Mm -hmm. So yeah, something something has, that has to like tell a story, not just of the character, but but of of the, like the world and and a little bit of history, and uh, yeah. And I, I think it was the first time for me to do something like that. Like even even though like I was before I came to Zoom, I was I was used to drawing figures and 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 doing that kind of stuff. Like my my first assignments were to draw chairs and doors. <laughs> so like doing something like here's a character and uh, you know make it look cool. Uh, <laughs> so the, that was the, that was a pretty cool assignment. But that, like, actually, for me personally, uh, Netpicker was, was and is like uh, dearest to me. For, first of all, I was trying to imitate some kind of painterly language that you were testing out uh, while painting the background. So I was just like, I think I asked for your brush head, and uh, yeah, I, I, I was just messing around with the brushes and stuff, and. Uh, it was Martin Luiga who I don't know if he was the one who finished the character, but like he he gave me the design brief, and like there's the big light sword and uh, and and this this sort of like attractive woman in somewhere in in a small fishing village, and uh, and yeah, so so I was combining like multiple things. I I was like trying to trying to find my way painting digitally and and also tell a story of this character mm -hmm. um but the thing that i find like really um that really like landed with this design uh that the concept like carries super well is sort of in the pose and the posture mm -hmm. of the character the um almost like a manneristically stylized like super long uh, swan neck and the sort of 
uh, defiant gaze, the sword, of course, and the posture and everything like that. It's a nice knight's uh, a knight's posture almost uh, applied to like a fishing uh, woman, like, um, a strong, independent woman. Yeah, yeah. so um, that's like communicated like super well in it, and, and um, I think that probably like also fed uh, informed. Uh, informed uh, the writers on sort of like uh, really colored their own like uh, understanding of the character and the net picker turned out to be the type of character that she is because of like uh, just the like incredibly strong posture in this image. Mm -hmm. I mean for me also what I like about that character and what ended up in the game and uh, like I don't, I don't need the mean the personal story of the character which which is awesome by the way but uh, like the character asset like 3d model uh, I I have a thing for asymmetrical design and uh, I think it just looks super cool that she's wearing that raincoat on one shoulder and mm -hmm. gives her like this iconic look and then she hands you a sword. I mean, the whole thing is like, this is not a medieval role-playing game. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, the sort of like uh, a lot of the characters today that, that I ended up doing are like this pretty regular, you know, four-limbed uh, symmetric like uh, beast. But mm -hmm. you also got to do the um, the cool ones, <laughs> the the, uh, uh, the scab leader, uh, which is pretty old. Uh, which has some like cool silhouette stuff like uh, going on. Yeah, it's this guy. I mean, this this one like uh, again. Uh, I I was sort of testing the capabilities of our our animator, and I'd like to say animators, but no, it was all in one of the in one of the Rubio who did like the whole video game. This girl is here from start to finish. Nuts. Um, but basically, like, uh, I don't know if you can see, like, this this little thumbnail here. So I did a bunch of these. They're literally, like, this big. And uh, I wanted to give him, like, this iconic sort of um, silhouette. And so what I ended up with, like, the character is, like, this strong, powerful figure. And, uh, and he kind of looks like a mecha, like, with the... With the jumpsuit rolled down, with like the ill-fitting clothes, and like, does he have four arms or are these boosters behind him? <laughs> and like, so so yeah, that, that that's what I was going for, just basically to get this like cool silhouette. Like in the end, in the game, he I think he's animated in a fairly simple way. Like he does like uh, stuff like that. Like it would be cool to see him like running and jumping. Like I, I'd like to see him in like, like a full-on cinematic sequence. <laughs> like this is the pon potential of this silhouette, basically. Mm. Then um, another another character that I did was the washerwoman, and I don't know. I I remember this one being fairly fairly straightforward. In, in the sense that, uh, like, m maybe maybe I was even given like a photograph of, of an old lady, or was it like some quick back and forth with uh, with the writer? I think it was Helen who I was uh, working working on Netpicker with. Yes, yeah, quite often uh, we got like a photo reference uh, mm -hmm. from the writers, uh, sometimes like a very specific one, like. The character in the is exactly this. Please like, make it as light as as much as this like as possible. Other times it's just like here's an array of like ten different sort of photos, very different, but you know <laughs> they're all sort of this. Um, yeah, because like the scab leader, for example, like he was wasn't he some kind of Greek actor or someone? It was just like this guy, <laughs> one to one to this guy. Uh, it, it was he's, he's a um, I forgot the name, Peter Dahl. He's a political commentator in, in the United States who, who had a pretty traumatic character arc himself, uh, which, which sort of uh, um, resolved uh, during the make, like, uh, happened during the making of like this Galicium. And, and <laughs> I don't know, he was we, we, funny stuff was happening. We were like looking at shits that's happening, uh, shit that ha that's happening in the world. And then mm -hmm. somehow, like, Peter Dow's face uh, was, I guess, inspiring. For, for this character, I mean, 
he he looks like a scab later. So yeah, I did. I didn't know that backstory. Like I I, I was handed that like image and the description is like go. <laughs> I think I probably misremembered the name actually. I don't, yeah. <laughs> I'm some political commentator guy. Yeah, memory. Uh, this is this is an episode of time travel. So, <laughs> but but with the net, uh, no, not the net, net picker. The the washer woman. Yeah. Um, so I I think I did like a photo study just to get into the mood, and then then did that, like, in my eyes, now really embarrassing, sloppy sort of drawing thing and threw on some color and was like, something like this. And, and Helen was like, exactly like this. And you were like, yeah. And, and then it went into modeling. And, and here we are, <laughs> all those years later. Yeah. Uh, it's really good. It's still like one of my favorite um, uh, concepts that you've done. Thank like, you. you can see the, the shapes, uh, the, uh, the big buff of the jacket, uh, the, uh, like, um, which is also like a, a resolved like a, a thumbnail scale is like the sort of shape language yeah i remember also uh painting the, the portrait uh, oh, yeah. this, uh, character uh yeah this is so this is like very much just like i took your concept as like the under almost like an underpainting and just like started painting on top of that but so the concept already uh, like Kind of looks like my grandma, so I just sort of like <laughs> let my mind drift and, and uh, sort of had like my memories of my grandmother uh, uh, as almost like mental reference and we can put this together. And, uh, yeah, uh, it's like uh, a very cute character and uh, sort of like one of my like quiet little favorites that we've uh, done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, hey, kids, like a character concept doesn't have to be super awesome. Other people might like it, even if you hate it. <laughs> mm. But yeah, that, that's kind of like uh, besides the point, because like I, I think I entered game dev still with the, the the false impression that everything you do has to like look like a Rembrandt or, or, or like an Ilya Repin painting or something like that. Like mm -hmm. often it is like like with your Lena, it's it's like shorthand just to keep the like wheels turning and and like every every everybody working towards the same goal and and uh yeah some some designs changed like radically we went through different things altogether mm -hmm. um in general i think uh I, I almost have like a design philosophical sort of like standpoint that um i try not to solve too many problems uh, at once in in a sort of like a single character concept Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes the faces are quite sketchy, sketchy like you can see on the gardener or, or uh, you know, the sort of like other characters uh, around here and, and uh, they you know solve the face later when i'm like doing the portrait or something mm -hmm. or, or like even like environment sketches or something uh, uh, it seems to me uh oh, nah. What's so, uh, greedy greedy to like stall all of the little design uh questions in the in the, you know, the the first uh, concept, uh, I like to leave a little bit of like juicy creative rooms for for my my uh, fellow compatriots and artists who are, you know, mm -hmm. also enjoy solving creative problems like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I, I think I think I indulge too much every now and then, uh, but but at some point like. Uh... I, I, I did a lot of the environment designs, so... And here again, just like with the characters, like sometimes you get a pretty detailed brief, like there's like an important story point happening in this area, so it has to include this, that, and like you have a whole shopping list of things from the writers. Uh, but but sometimes it was fairly vague, and, and then I could sort of just lose myself noodling, drawing like details, thinking of like little stories and like my own interpretations of what's going on there. And then later playing the game and seeing like, oh, like writers like went off a tangent with this thing and just like it's a whole new swath of content that's that that came from that like, I don't know, little thing that was drawn somewhere. So uh, yeah, I don't know. It's 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 in that sense, this is Amtkunstwerk that's uh, that's uh, a video game is is awesome like everybody like coming together. It's very rewarding stuff. 
Um, okay, so this is your drawing, uh, but kind of based on my design. Wait, yeah, do you have the original sketch? Uh, no, <laughs> probably somewhere. Uh, but like that thing is oh, sort of like in, yeah, so in, in, in my character designer career, like the, 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 the most interesting and rewarding thing that I got to do, which is like fallout black god studios fallout's power armor design but for like our own game and uh and it's just like this really shitty pencil drawing that i labored over a very long time on some kind of like school notebook paper or something like that so i'm really glad that that you made this into like a painting and 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 like this uh breakdown for for was it Rauna or Pasha who modeled this? Uh, Pasha modeled it, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so so this was a quite the endeavor. Um the sort of like uh, original concept for just like um organically patterned uh, uh ceramic plates that like click it against each other and dissipate the uh, kinetic energy like across the surface of, of the body armor. Mm -hmm. So like the original concept, uh, the the uh, the, um, the idea for it just came from uh, from uh, Robert, from like a pretty specific sort of like idea how mechanically the, the uh, armor should work. And then, uh, uh, yeah, Kaspar did the uh, heavy lifting sort of like groundwork um, uh, design for it. And uh, then I had the sort of like luxury of like uh, from a distance coming in and then. It's um, a lot harder to come up with something from the very foundation, the very beginning, and then like uh, solve it and then finish it, like all the way to the to the sort of like finish line. It's a lot easier to, and then the, it's also the sort of like the magic of collaboration to like see something that someone has really put in, like one hundred percent in, and then you can like just put like twenty percent extra in sort of together. It's like one hundred and twenty percent. I mean, yeah, this uh, this this kind of looks it. Mm. But like, yeah, I'm really proud of that the kind of stuff that we arrived at again. Like the the design brief also was uh, sort of like um, Robert wanted to be, it, it to be unique. He was like, yeah, it's, it should be ceramic and like the the kinetic energy dissipation, but also wanted to some kind of illogical thing. So if you look at it, like in in all kinds of historical traditional armor, like joints are protected. But here, like the backs of the knees and like you can stab the guy in, in, in the kidney <laughs> through this armor. And like this was a deliberate design choice. Um, I think I, I remember seeing some kind of maybe it was an art project or something, something like a ceramic, like beautiful white ceramic uh, samurai armor held together with like red strings. And uh, th this was sort of the jumping off point. And then after, after, after that, it was like trying to figure out that this layered sort of like tree bark sort of thing. So just like this interesting, interesting, like almost fractal um, patterns, like where we have like these bigger plates and smaller plates and like I ideally, like the process of such a such a suit of armor, like every every suit of armor would be customly tailored to the to the wearer. So you don't have like any like two uh, identical sets of armor. So like, uh, like 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 the world building for that thing is is also super cool. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the, the the shapes that are in this armor. Uh... There's like a few various sort of like uh, places where some ideas were stolen from. Uh, there's a, um, unfortunately, I, I don't remember the name of this uh, fashion designer who, who uh, made his pieces uh, in the process where he like wrapped fabric around uh, like the human body, mm -hmm. and then uh, fucking cryo freezed it or somehow like got it to be like stiff and, and, and fragile so that way you like mm -hmm. bend uh, the arm. We sort of like uh, you could break the material. Okay. You would, uh, figure out the um, uh, you know the, the pattern, the cut of, of the like garment. Like where are these sort of like tension lines, and how do we resolve mm -hmm. 
is sort of like uh, organic uh, shard like shapes that, that uh, originate from it. It's a, like very interesting uh, aesthetic and, and the sort of like uh, look and feel of this armor uh, uh, references the sort of like the, the aesthetic of that uh, quite a bit. Mm-hmm. At other times, sort of like the chest plate uh, is like, you know, has like this, uh, the two lungs kind of thing going on and uh, has like anatomical moments in there. But then uh, all in all, uh, the game is set in, in sort of like this uh, alternate history, modernity, uh, time period of modernity, you know, like industrial production, and the sort of aesthetic of, of that era. So this armor is like way sci-fi and, and futuristic looking and like very strange and to sort of yeah. like bring it back and ground it in, into it a little bit. And it has that like doinky looking uh, kind of alien but surprisingly fitting like World War One British uh, soldier helmet uh, thing. Mm-hmm. You know, steel plate, which is like pumped into like a helmet shape and uh, there you go. Uh, which adds this like, um, yeah, ground it into like this time period. Uh, mm-hmm. And so yeah, in the in the game we uh like the player cannot find all the pieces of the armor to wear. Uh so he always has to like the player has to mix and match with uh, some other things. But uh like the the three characters that wear the armor, only only one of them wears the helmet and, and the root with his with his rifle. I don't know. He looks like a super soldier. So like that that design came together like really well and yeah the voice acting and, and the writing for that stuff as well it's it's re- really awesome to see see that sort of come come to life in in, in the video game mm-hmm. mm. but yeah this uh, it almost covers the characters that i drew for the game Was there some? Yeah, I don't. I don't remember right now. Mm. I also. I also included some of the, some of the inventory art here because, um, not that it has much to do with the with the character design and characters that we. Uh, we were just talking about, aside from the fact that uh, the inventory icons include all the wearable items, in the game. Um, but I, I wanted to talk about like the the design part that that deals with um, readability and, and and how it's tied with the character design. Like in in my opinion, uh, is it, if you remember, we like rethought the whole character design pipeline from like concept sketch to modeling, to uh, animating, like three, three times. Like we, at first we, we thought that we can sort of come up with some kind of modular system where, where all the, we can assemble characters from parts. Similar, similarly unsuccessful attempt uh, that we considered using for level design. <laughs> And uh, and then we moved away from that. Uh, but I don't like there was I don't for some kind of technical reason we we. Oh no, it wasn't technical. The third time I think was uh, the aesthetic choice to sort of push the readability of characters or something like that. So we started like gamifying them a little bit. I don't know. I might misremember. Remember? How do you remember that? Yeah, I mean, we definitely, yeah, we, we, at first we did try to do the optimize, sort of like the, the wizard wise beyond our years, uh, from the get go and design of, uh, uh, combining characters out of like pants and then jackets and like different heads, mm-hmm. like you would from in like a role playing uh, game. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then, uh, uh, fortunately, uh, sort of like mid development, we just saw that it doesn't look good, man. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have the character. And then we're like sort of like um, there's a couple of characters in the game that still use it for like basically legacy reasons that were like oh, not good enough or like not enough time. I, th- to I think Lena's one, right? Lena is one of them. Yeah, I, just, I feel so. Okay, that's that's one that I feel really bad about. Uh, 
that's her. Yeah, it's like such a like a charming character. Like we just really feel that like um, we owed it to her to like, give her like a special new character model that's really modeled from the get go. Mm-hmm. Sort of like uh, taking into consideration like all the like, uh, peculiarities. Because like she's in a wheelchair and like um, the, like the clothes that she's wearing and stuff. Uh, the way that it's very obvious in the game that it's just like 3D models floating, you know, in proximity to each other to take the shape of this character. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, I think Lena deserved better than that. Alas, this is the reality that we live in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh, now coming from characters back to the inventory icons, mm-hmm. like, again, the, the user interface uh interface huh. that uh y- you were you were designing that stuff you I, I think you did all of the ui like yeah. menu by menu or something but i didn't see that happen because it was like you disappeared for a week or two and then you came back with like finished stuff like <laughs> After, after what, when digging in the Photoshop files, I saw that, oh, the reiteration. So you, you must have been working with somebody, like. Uh, yeah, the, the UI kind of sort of went through several iterations and then it was a nightmare and then still is a bit of a nightmare really for handle and, mm-hmm. and to, I don't know, she keeps breaking, we have to fix it all the time. Uh, but in the sort of original uh, inventory design, to illustrate just how amateur we were, uh, you didn't even have the like the big, um, the big art. The preview point. thing at the top. Yeah, you just had like the name of the image and description for it, and then like the inventory grid, mm-hmm. which is incredibly unsatisfying. You like click on like an inventory item, and you don't see a big picture of it. Oof. It just makes you angry at a game if you can't like you know, take a look at your, the stuff that you're like carrying around. Um, so sort of like uh, midway through development, after like already doing like various artistic experimentations on on the item items, uh, doing all sorts of like, explorations into like modernity and then uh, like Kasper was channeling some Cezanne, uh, Cezanne like into into like the item items. And somewhere like halfway through through the uh, development, we had to sort of like uh, reconsider and repaint. Uh, all of our item icons uh, to like bring them up to this like uh, detail fidelity so that they would also work as like these large illustrations when you actually click on them on the inventory. I, I seem to remember it slightly differently. I think it was um, like I was doing the first round on all the icons and I was like three three quarters through the whole batch. It, it was an endless process. You come into work, you're like, okay. There we go. <laughs> First icon in the evening, like I did four today. <laughs> uh, and like some, some days were faster. It's just like, but there were hundreds of these. And I think at one point I was like, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a really limiting thing. I was showing you something like, I wish we could look at it as a large thing. And I think you were like, but why don't we? And <laughs> like, why don't we? And I did a quick mock up in, in inventory, like, Maybe we could like do a big one and like, okay, let's see if we can make that happen. And it was, uh, the way we designed the, or like the way we programmed the user interface, like making changes is a real pain in the ass, um, was then and is now. (laughs) And, uh, but that thing was like, somehow came together really quickly and, uh, like change the whole inventory experience, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm, sort of um, in, in hindsight, fairly obvious things that we like also stumbled upon and then had to account for was um, at first we were sort of like doing these in a very kind of like freewheeling kind of way. Mm-hmm. So you have your jackets, you know, it would, um, uh, make your jacket icon uh, to sort of uh, present to each individual item in its like best light. Mm-hmm. So you have you know, the fuck the world uh, jacket, then like it will make sense to have like the back of the jacket, mm-hmm. say proudly. Um, but then once you have a bunch of these sort of like lined up on your screen, it just becomes like so much visual noise, and it's impossible to pick out like where each jacket or like to distinguish between the different categories of items, 
it's just like it's not a very pleasant experience to sort through all of your stuff when it looks like that. Uh, so we we learned pretty quickly that uh, you need to have uh, you need to standardize aspects of, of like uh, stuff that you show in grids like this. So all the jackets ended up being like very like symmetric from like head on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think there's something like uh, the stuff that you can put into your hand is all like you know tilted one way. Uh, stuff that other stuff is like the, the, the other way so that there is a, a sort of like a systematic and um, um, a system to, to, to the visuals so at a glimpse you can sort of like um, have an understanding of what category an item belongs in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's like a learning moment and it's still crazy to see some like in in, in the final versions of the items like some of the things are very close to the initial initial sort of like lasso tool silhouettes <laughs> mm -hmm. and and there's other stuff like for example for me like i i really i don't know something happened so i was like really working on all of the health items but in the end you only see the tiny icon when you pick them up and then they go into your like health item slot <laughs> so like ah all the wasted time i did learn like a lot of interesting things about digital painting during the process but uh yeah I mean, <laughs> that was sort of funny mm -hmm. and and some other stuff that uh like for example it took forever sort of to nail down this thing and uh i think it went between you and me like three times or something like that just just like the, the icon of this helmet and and uh yeah we don't have the sort of the the gloves here but uh i think i did like two or three different takes and and the stuff that in, ended up in the game is finally like your addition where you like fix something with like a few big bold brush strokes basically i think that was sort of one of the main things that we ran up against is that uh... You sort of like get you get a little bit lost in in uh, like noodling away at the details or sort of like this uh, micro level expressive brushwork when you're doing it, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, uh, you just like have to take a step back and okay, have to put like a really big like wide brush to mm -hmm. something to simplify for the for for iconic purposes basically. Mm -hmm. so, there was something that uh, like. Uh, painting like the various jackets and stuff, uh, I, I really learned to uh, understand uh, stop one step value change that differences in, in shading and painting. Mm -hmm. It's like the really subtle uh, like ways that you like you almost don't perceive how like a color is darker than another color and how it like turns to form only a little bit. Uh, I, I tend to be a very like bravado, expressive, uh, sort of like painter, like the more contrast, the better. <laughs> but painting the item icons like really made me like see that, really appreciate like the micro contrast between and how to use this and sort of like rendering. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the reasons uh, why I really wanted to, to see the icons as larger icons because I think like one of the early compromises was like, okay, so when you pick up the item, then the icon becomes larger. And when you hold it, you can look at it. <laughs> Um, uh, but it's it's the dice, the custom dice that you can get from Dice Maker. But like one of them has a mosquito in them. Like it's it's not in this in this layout, but like it's a detail you like. I have twenty twenty or however you call that vision where you can see stuff like from seventy blocks away, uh, and and even I like playing the game. I was like, where's that mosquito? <laughs> And and it did like because of like the type of bug a mosquito is, it didn't make sense to make it into like a caricature of a fat mosquito or something like I don't know. Even mm -hmm. though it, it would have been cool if uh, if it were uh, bloated, not swollen, in, in trapped in amber. Oh my god, that's like a lost design opportunity. Oh no, call back all copies. We have to redo the whole thing. <laughs> Maybe we can patch it in. Um. But yeah, I think I think we went on a tangent here. But basically, yeah, it was like it, it took us a very long time, uh, years basically, to figure out like the final look of 
of the inventory icon similarly to to uh, how the characters look in the game. Mm -hmm. But uh, in that sense, yeah, like a, a shout out to uh, Black Isle Studios Baldur's Gate games, which had I think still have like some of the some of the best inventory art ever it's just like these beautifully rendered pencil drawings and uh i like i'm I'm not even kidding uh like it's it's some of the stuff that actually got me into art because i was yeah i think i was always drawing but but I, I never i don't know as a kid you don't consider becoming uh a drunk painter who dies early and then becomes famous as as a valid career choice but mm -hmm. but after seeing like all of these things, it was like, I had to buy this game. <laughs> like this is somebody pays somebody for this to happen, and, and yeah, it's still some of the, my favorite art. Yeah, no, those pencil sketches, like they like uh, uh, they taught me like how like a uh, as, as a dungeon master, you know, how I should draw uh, uh, the magic weapons and everything. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, dealing out to to to, to my uh, friends, the players, and that stuff. Uh, re really magical stuff, basically. Just uh, the the um, lot of kids here, so it really teaches you the, like the the, the uh, important. Like you really see the importance of the, the the magical moment of like looking at the sketch of, of this like item. Mm -hmm. It's like, it is really you know. Uh, at least for me, I'm the type of person where the whatever like status effects and uh, I don't know this like uh, mace, uh, I don't know this like play ice damage or some shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's pretty cool, I guess. But it's really about like clicking on it and then seeing the like intricate like Da Vinci esque like you know, tongue out of the corner with your mouth like really rendered like uh, sketches and stuff. That was where the magic happened for me. But but the funny thing about that is that uh, early on, when the user interface looked nothing like like it does in the final game, that was also like some time when we were exploring alternative ways of showing the showing the items. And uh, like I remember, I tried to channel that Baldur Skate sort of vibe and do like pencil sketches of things. And that's when I realized that even though I had spent years like doing percep perceptive drawing, like drawing from nature. Like I was a really, really, really bad designer. I had no idea at all of like what constitutes good design in a drawing. Like trying to take something like I think the first thing I tried doing was uh, was that um, the protagonist was wearing actually like a different type of shirt with the frills and like very baroque. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was trying to draw that dress shirt, but it's like okay, but. How do you make take a dress shirt, and make it into an icon? So it has to, like again, it has to read as a shape, and and how do you stylize it so that you can see like all the necessary details? And like in, in that sense, yeah, that still the border skate stuff is just like beats anything that came yeah. afterwards. Like uh, crazy. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Did you want to add something? No, I think like yeah, th those are my thoughts and guidance. Okay, yeah, I, I I included I included portraits here. Like it would make sense to talk about like character portraits, a really big part of Disco Elysium, and like in the same breath as uh, as the rest of character design. But I think uh, let's, we'll just, we'll just like yeah, let's uh, let's call this a wrap, and mm -hmm. uh, and devote uh, another video for this this stuff. So, oh, yeah. Teaser, very clever. <laughs> yes, yeah. and uh, on this cliffhanger, thank you for watching, and uh, see you soon. See you soon. Hey there, my name is Casper uh, Damsalo. I'm from Zoom Studio, the video game studio that brought you Disco Elysium and Disco Elysium Final Cut. For Disco Elysium, I did. Uh, various concept art and level design. And uh, I'm here with Alexander Rostov. That's me. I'm Alexander Rostov. I'm the art director on Disco Museum. And then uh, with me in this uh, special uh, day and moment. Wow. The studio mascot. <laughs>
oh, I'm confused at what's happening. Uh, so that's us. Let's get down to what is it that we're talking about today? Wait, I'm, I'm looking at this internet fame animal. Um, yeah, uh, we'll be talking about uh, character portraits and skill portraits and, you know, their, their role in, uh, in Disco Elysium. So, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. I, I have one of those, one of the charts with the characters in front of us. So, yeah, you, you painted like 6,000 character portraits. And, uh, yeah, it was a uh, sort of uh, altogether mega project that just like uh, you keep, keep, you keep it rolling throughout the sort of like the, like five or six years of development, however long that was. Like, um, as new characters sort of like come up and then, uh, um, are developed and put into the game and stuff, then I need to like work on it, put those portraits in, baby. Uh, yeah. No. That, that took a, took a long time. Uh, the sort of like uh, the uh, immense time span that, that they were painted across also means that the uh, the style and then the approach and the portraits uh, like this uh, uh, changes uh, over time, um, both as like you know you grow and develop as an artist uh, and your sort of like understanding of what you're trying to achieve slightly shifts, and then also because like the characters themselves are also individually different and uh, this sort of warrants always or quite often a, a, like a unique or interesting approach to their specific portrait. And so it's quite eclectic. But like, personally, I, I really like the portraits, but did you ever consider using, I don't know, 3D models or, or anything like that instead? Um, Not really. <laughs> Not really, yeah. I just like drawing faces. That's that's my like main thing. My my like uh, basic doodle or whenever I'm like a meeting, it's like you know, you get the hand twitching to like draw something. I just start doodling, uh, like coming up with faces and then mm -hmm. using characters and uh, stuff. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I have a similar thing, but I just have that one face that I draw over and over and over again. It's like I should burn half of my sketchbooks. Everybody has that face. My face uh, I have stolen from uh, Mignola. It is uh, the primary characteristic of, of the, that face that I sometimes draw is the... Oh, the sucking in cheekbone. Mm -hmm. Mike Mignola does like, I don't know, half the characters Mike Mignola draws mm -hmm. has like super like um, refined and defined like uh, the silhouette in that place. And then, then yeah, it's, that's 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 good shit. The, you can you can tell like half the characters' life story just by the shape of like this moment in their face. Mm -hmm. How did the like? Are there any any of the earlier portraits in this spread? No, maybe not. Maybe not in this one. But uh, uh... oh, was I think Glacia was one of the earliest portraits that I did. Yeah, and, and she she went in almost unchanged from like uh, the the earlier designs. Kim is also. Yeah, Kim, your own portrait, Kim and Klaas, I think, was the first one. Mm -hmm. Kim and and uh, and uh, your portrait as a character, I think, were sort of like done uh, even before like any like real development in 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 the stylization for the portraits had been done, mm -hmm. and these are just sort of like the, almost illustrations. I don't know how obvious this is, but to me, they look like almost from a different world compared to like a lot of the other portraits. Mm -hmm. And Claudia was sort of the first uh, character who uh, was painted after like some thought had been put into the uh, the technique uh, that should, uh, mm -hmm. the technique for the portraits basically. So it's just like heavy use of this like uh, graphic shapes and then, the, you know, simplifying all the like sort of blacks together into, into big simple shapes and then putting uh, on a, like a limited palette of colors mm -hmm. uh, to sort of like try and um, use the color scape to I don't know get some get to something at the like at the character and their personality. Mm -hmm. For Glacia, that's sort of the main thing that's like really inspired uh, that really like hooked the character for me was the the fr fringe of the of the hair like really low on the on the eyes. Mm -hmm. 
and it's like really like you know puts the eyes into the shadow and then like obscures like the the eyebrows which are you know the incredibly important to read someone's like uh, character and, and their personality and their mood and stuff and then since Glacia is uh, it's like you know this like character mystery then uh, hiding uh, the eyebrows is like an important moment in, in my life when I when I came to that it was like ah, this is it this is mm -hmm. now Glacia. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But yeah, like you mentioned Mike Minolo, so like uh, a lot of these, if, if not most of these, and even the ones that are slightly more painted, there's still like that very graphic underpinning. Uh, we can look at a short clip soon uh, where you can see some, some of the process. But basically, like you, you start with the like a black and white thing where you block in the big brick proportions and, and big shadow shapes, and then you basically paint into it. Something like that, uh, something like that, yeah. Sort of, uh, oftentimes I noticed that one of the first things I do is I try to put uh, down the shadow of the nose. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the rest of the face like grows uh, around it. Uh, and also, so maybe it's because it's so central to the face, you know, the nose is right there in the middle. Or, or maybe there's some uh, subconscious understanding there that the nose is the eye, is the the nose is the window to the human soul or something. I'm not, I'm not sure, but it's always uh, like a landmark that I try to put down first. I mean, I really like this because like in art school, that's that's the opposite uh, of, of what teachers tell a young students. It's like, you never start from the nose or eyes or anything like big shapes first. But uh, yeah, I, I've also noticed that like getting some kind of like jawline or nose line in it like helps helps define something that I can grasp onto. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but yeah, do we check the video? Uh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, okay, now we're gonna have to. We're recording a different different screen, so there you go. Uh. So you want to sync this? You ready? <laughs> Three, two, one, play. Play. Uh, so this is this is a Procreate recording, and I, I I don't know. It, it seemed to me like a couple of years into development, when uh, when when we discovered Procreate, something something happened. It's yeah. It's it's like. It's amazing, basically, uh, the the sort of the, the dream of, of having, you know, this like slab that you can just break out anywhere that like has a silk illuminated screen. So you're like uh, independent from like light conditions outside and stuff. Uh, it's just a really great way to paint. Mm -hmm. and, man, this video is fast. We're already past the, the kid. <laughs> so this is a portrait of the, the, uh, the cleaning lady. Uh, I guess you can see me sort of like putting together the sketch here, sort of trying to imitate a little bit of like a charcoal uh, workflow. But an important sort of thing when I was thinking about this is, um, is when I put it together, uh, I wanted to have the broom uh, in, in the image. So a cleaning lady broom, it's sort of like a part of the identity of this person. Mm -hmm. uh, I also wanted it to have like this, um, you know, this grip. Uh, it's like a rifle grip from like, uh, the red guards or something. I think I've seen some a grip like this in some like you know a big like Soviet parade photo or like the, the red guards meeting uh, Lenin or something somewhere. Mm -hmm. So you know it's, it's the weapon, it's the tool, it's like uh, uh, her sort of like power symbol and stuff. So I wanted to get like a really like an anatomical kind of like grip on it. Mm -hmm. so, um, and in general, sort of like this grim determination of like you know these hallways will be cleaned. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that's the we're reaching the end of the video. Mm -hmm. like temperature uh, experimentation in the end, uh, always in in digital painting. Uh, there's like a thing that uh, oftentimes happens that a lot of like digital painters do is uh, because the the sort of like uh, medium itself is so malleable. Mm -hmm. uh, then um, 
uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, you, you finish a painting and you, you've, uh, the painting has looked a certain way and, you know, you've uh, rendered all of your decisions, putting down like this, like cold blue here or this like warm light there uh, within the context of how the picture looks right now. And then at the very end, you take out like an 11 slider or like some like color effect that you just like completely change the image. <laughs> Uh, and it feels incredibly good in the end because, like, all of a sudden, this image that you've gotten very tired of uh, becomes so fresh again. It always seems like, ah, oh, this was the genius move. Now it became good. Uh, and oftentimes, this is a mistake. <laughs> you just got, get blinded by the, the novelty of the, of the effect. And uh, if you sometimes maybe like come back a few days later and you look at what you did. Uh, mm -hmm. it's like, uh, I mean, yeah, that, that's something like that I've noticed with with most things. It's like if if you do like an intense bout of painting, then you sort of need to take at least a few days off, depending on the on the I don't know size and complexity of the project to to get the fresh eyes. Otherwise, you you get used to certain things and you also get fixated on certain mistakes. Like I found that like two months is the optimal time. Like two months go past, you look at it again, then then you have like the most objective sort of uh, perspective on things. Like yeah, two months is magical. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's also yeah, you can also even have like you know the one day after is kind of like we're still feeling, but still remember what it felt like last uh, like last night. And you can like, kind of go in there and like work off of that. One week later is like a also a very specific sort of like. You still faintly remember, you like remember the aroma in your nose or something. <laughs> Too much, where you can have like this clinical understanding of, uh, of an image. I mean, but but then again, there's like also the flip side is is I think one of the worst feelings is is when you're working late into the night on this um like I I don't know it's like a bipolar high or something like that and and you're super excited and this is this is like genius you just like made a breakthrough. And then, uh, then you pass out exhausted, you wake up, you go open up the file or look at the painting and it's just, it's not good. <laughs> like, it's really bad. <laughs> so uh, in that sense, yeah, like this is crazy. I, I'm back in the Magma studio looking at the, at the, like the, the greed of the portraits and it's, this is okay. just, a lot of a lot of portrait work. Uh, at, at the bottom here, we have the um, uh, rubies and and uh, archers, uh, worship condition worship archer, radio operators, uh, portraits uh, right next to each other. Yeah. Uh, which is quite fortunate because uh, these two are among my favorite uh, portraits in the game. These two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so. At some point, like time, time got so tight on making this condition that uh, portraits, as these frivolous side considerations that they are, uh, like the, the only moments that I had for the time, the only moment, the only time I had to sort of like work on this was like either like airplanes or when I was like traveling <laughs> somewhere or something. So I remember I painted Ruby in, in like a in like an uh, art school cafe in Edinburgh, visiting like a friend in the, in the university there. Mm -hmm. It's like a really eureka moment uh, as well. I really felt like a globe trotting traveling artist and Ruby came together. Uh, it's just, there's something about like the the uh, intensity of the expression in her eyes and stuff, which was like a real breakthrough moment uh, for me. Mm -hmm. um, which, which uh, in my mind, uh, also put like a lot of the other portraits to shame and. and really made me want to go and revisit like older portraits, but you know, not in time. Uh, and then right next to it is the Coalition Worship Archer portrait, which is one of the new portraits for the final cut as part of the moralist uh, quest line. Mm -hmm. uh, you can uh, you can get in contact with the airships that are sort of quietly uh, patrolling the, the skies above the city. Uh, it's very ominous and, and uh, silent uh, presence. And, and you never quite get to see the sort of the, the human face uh, of it either. You just get, you know, you're interacting with this uh, person through a radio. And, and uh, this person has also like completely subsumed themselves uh, to the duty that they're doing. So you're not talking to, you know, uh, whatever her name is. Uh, you're talking to the uh, position that she represents. Mm -hmm. So the portrait itself is also like, very distant from from the human uh, character. And so and it's like a... 
uh, when I like found the moment to, to hide her face, uh, the only like um, uh, detail of her face into the, the, the radio microphone itself, mm -hmm. it felt like, yeah, that clicked. Uh, it, it took a while to like really like uh, search out the, 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 the conceptual basis for this uh, portrait, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but then after after that clicked, it was like another like uh, two hours of like, uh, it's a very simple portrait uh, to just kind of like sit down and draw it. It's, you know, like I don't know, 20 minutes of work or something. Like uh, you really know what you're doing and you're just like, you know, putting down the marks. Uh, but the, the sort of like search for it afterwards was, was uh, took like, more hours and hours but then the really like uh, the moment where it like completely clicked and locked for me this is very specific because it's like it's it's uh, i hope my mouse is visible and uh this that one brush up? the one brush up just yeah <laughs> like that's where it like it's like okay pencils down no can't do anything more with this like, now it's perfect mm -hmm. which is I don't know why that happens. Some like this is like a, a um, caprice of, of like a, of like an art of art or this year. There's like these moments when shit like this happens and locks and like mm -hmm. so like you shouldn't change it anymore. The good thing has happened. Don't risk it. I mean, yeah. So, um, I mean, yeah. What what, what I like about the uh. The airship archer uh, portrait is is again like it's it's like this abstract design that's holding it together, and uh, like with, with the rest of them, they're all sort of different, uh, but they also represent like very different characters. Like some of my my own favorite ones, I think Idiot Doom Sp Spiral is is my favorite. It's this dude. Like there's there's something like it did the drunks I think also in in like one go. And and there's something about that uh, sort of reality bleeding away from them this 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 in, intoxicated sort of thing. So like see into the characters like this allows you to yeah. This is something something that doesn't come uh, through in in. I don't know, using Unreal's that fake character creation thing or th that abstraction, that that stylization. It's not this photorealism. Uh, there's a, yeah, like this entire domain of meaning that can, that can be uh, tapped into and used uh, in, in just like how the image is put together and what this reflects about the character. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, yeah, that we did was uh, oftentimes we tried to bundle the characters together who share some sort of. Uh, common uh common theme or so mm -hmm. and alcoholics were like all painted together and and uh, yeah they're like the their main gist is that they have uh, drink the drink and brr, the world melts away from your, your head and you're doing this like self annihilation thing so mm -hmm. the sort of the structure and rigid the rigid like structure underneath that, uh, which in painting terms is the drawing is you know melting away so um and uh, there's uh, quite a few of these sorts of like uh, things happening. Mm -hmm. One of the ones that that uh, kind of like uh, crashed and crashed and burned was uh, at one point we wanted to do all the, the drivers. Uh, so like Tommy Lehom and then Sealang and then the uh, yes, yeah, Ruby as well, uh, so that they would be modeled after their. Driver's uh, licenses. Tri yeah, driver's license portraits. I think we just have the racist one here. Yes, yeah, the racist one. The it's racist one has the driver's license face and, and uh, Tommy has it. Uh, but then somehow by the time it was like Sealang and, and, and uh, Ruby's turn, then mm -hmm. so that's like sort of melted away somewhere. Sealang is just like uh, parting around and Ruby's in a very different place. Mm -hmm. Except the kind of works because she's not, at that point, uh, you aren't speaking to her as a drop driver, you're speaking to her as a very different sort of. Uh, Mm -hmm. A VIP. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's uh, it, it it's it's cool to see like s some of them because like uh, uh, as we talked in another video, um, you you also concepted most of the characters and and some of these characters I did the concepts for and it's really strange 
sort of like to then see somebody else paint, paint the portraits based off that concept. So like I use some kind of photo reference here or there. Some of the things were like completely invented. And then then this is this is like that recently trending thing on, on social media, like draw this in your style. So you take somebody else's thing and then you repaint it. So this was like you discoed up like my my drawings thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, yes. like the smoker, for example, and 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 Ruby as well, and uh, and and this Rene here, which was my attempt to sort of like capture that thing. But I think it, it was also fairly early on when you were still looking for for that like exact process. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one of the main things about the, the aesthetic was the use of like flats and stuff, and mm -hmm. not so much to rely on like soft uh, edges. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean that was something that was really difficult for me to sort of like accept that I'm I'm a really bad imitator. Uh, like, but but that came through like after trying a few of these, like okay, yeah, you know, I I, I can do some prep work, but like you you gotta push it over the finish line. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it's it's also super fun to see like all the. Well, that, there's like a genre of fan art that exists for Disco Museum where people do like self portraits or like portraits of their friends or something uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in imitation of this like Disco Museum portraiture style, uh, which is oh, that's uh, some that's some like the, you could you could put that in a in a bottle and call it some sort of an ism. <laughs> this is uh, very much a, a modernist uh, tradition. I mean, it's, I, I tried to find the, the one of their artists. Like, I actually wanted to commission my portrait from her. Mm. <laughs> it's like she she has this whole uh, sort of like series. Like she does, I think, commission portraits mm -hmm. in, in, in that style. And there's like referencing elements from the game. And it's like there was a couple photo. I don't know. Was it, was it like a wedding gift or something that made them look like. Uh, like a couple with uh, Dolores Day above them. It's like <laughs> the whole thing is is is, is cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, we we talk about the character portraits and, and the style, but then then we have skill portraits. Like this is this was not the original design, was it? Oh, man! It took us a while to to arrive at that. the um. Uh, skill portraits to various uh, uh, dead ends and, and sort of like uninspiring um, ideas. Uh, oof, man, yeah. Like we wanted to do them at first as sort of like graphic shapes, so almost like abstract graphics, or sort of uh, lean into more into the graphic design. And yeah, the, 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 graphic, the graphic design, uh, you know, it's your skill sheet, it's sort of more in the in the uh, mathematical gameplay structures, uh, it, that it existed more in the mathematical gameplay structure and design aspect of the game, and less uh, in this like uh, in in world or or uh, in less in this thematic realm of the of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, but but um, yeah, then at some point like a breakthrough happened where uh, it's, uh, it's faces. It has to be faces. Uh, we're good at making faces. Mm -hmm. She's good at making creepy, weird, melty faces and 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 and, and stuff. And it's just um, um, you know, all the all the uh, it's it's pretty well known that humans are attracted to faces and then uh, these are like uh, meaningful for us. Uh, they grab our attention and then when when something is said with a face next to it, what is being said is much more impactful. Mm -hmm. so, so it had to be. Some sort of like a face thing going on. I mean, I I really like these because um, I mean, let's set aside the fact that like it, it, it kind of changed the way you play the game because like these these things are actually like more characters than than they would have been with the with these like simple graphic shapes, mm -hmm. uh, logos. Let's call them. But uh, like when 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 the skills like right now, 
they sort of, uh, how to put it, they represent something more than just a name for a thing. It's, it's not like one of my favorites, two of my favorites, actually. I think this one was conceptualization and uh, visual calculus. Mm -hmm. Like these, these are my favorites of, of the whole bunch. Um, but it, it kind of represents not just the, the skill or like the activity of, 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 of like exercising that skill, but it also the experience of like what it, what it feels like. It's it, when you're doing something like that, it's, you know, lived experience or I don't know. Like if we had a skill that was like drawing, then if, if it was represented in, in this fashion, like the way you, you figured out for this, then it wouldn't just be like drawing, but it would be, you look at it, you would get some kind of inkling of the, of the feeling, what it's like to draw or mm -hmm. something, something. I, I don't know. I, I didn't put it too well, but uh, yeah, why, why I really like these, like this approach. There is a sense, so there's some sort of like, you need to tap into some sort of a mystical sensory feeling based like understanding of, of the thing and like really that like uh, non-language uh, understanding uh, mm -hmm. of, of uh, phenomena sort of like put together like a visual image in, in your head it was also like um, the skill the skill uh, portraits came together uh, like incredibly quickly it was basically like uh, start it was something like you know uh, on the weekend, hung out with Robert, came up with the idea, yeah, this should just be like basic, let's try it, cool abstractation shit. You know, Monday, show up at the studio, and take a sketchbook, like go and like eat lunch uh, in like a cafe and stuff. And then like by Tuesday evening, after a couple of lunches, like all the skills are like the basic mm -hmm. shit and stuff, or, like, figured out uh, while like stuffing food into my mouth or something. Uh, and then it was just like sit down and start painting. Mm. But yeah, sort of like the, 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 the um, I don't know how to talk about how the visuals came together. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess that's also because we. This is why we're visual <laughs> visual artists, not not writers per se. <laughs> yeah, this is sort of the, the this is the art of, of, of painting, or like this is where uh, the, the the mystery happens. Mm -hmm. um, So yeah, I don't know. I I think we we reached the end of of this 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 portrait portrait talk video thing. So uh, let's call it a wrap. Thank you for watching, and uh, see you around. <laughs> Hi there. My name is Kaspar Damsalo, and I'm from Studio Zoom, the studio that brought you Disco Elysium and Disco Elysium Final Cut. And I'm here with uh, Alexander Rostov. Uh, hi, I'm Alexander Rostov. I was uh, principally the uh, art director on Disco Elysium. And uh, today we're going to take a look at some uh, environments uh, from the game. Mm -hmm. And I was the, I guess you could say, the principal. Uh, environment designer on the game even though early on i think it was pretty evenly spread out we were both working on trying to figure out how the how the game should look um but then you went off to work focus more on like characters and and the user interface and 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 then sort of we figured out the pipeline was that uh, i would do the sketches work with the 3d artist uh, we would bounce it back and forth and then you would do the final painting and make it make it look disco mm. yeah so i guess uh, if you wanted to summarize it it could be like the entire world of disco elysium has been uh, drawn by uh Kaspar and then painted by uh, alexander <laughs> yeah i'm i'm the draftsman <laughs> in this in this formula mm. yeah it's it's going to be interesting like looking at this stuff um because I, I I never expected to be doing any any kind of environment design or industrial design for any any video game, um, so it, it 
early on it was like almost crippling the anxiety that came with it and then yeah, like, like your backgrounds in like uh the figure studies and stuff huh? yeah i was like i'm used to working from life and drawing you know naked ladies uh and then yeah like first assignment draw a bunch of chairs and doors it's like hmm, okay cool it should fit this this thematic thing <laughs> here's some reference photos but make it unique and I was like okay cool yeah i grabbed my pencil and paper i think i didn't have like a work computer then and uh, did, did some awful drawings like w without having any kind of idea what goes into this like overthinking everything and uh yeah but uh then then at some point yeah we, we got into the groove and uh i mean the entire like process was a massive learning uh, uh let's say opportunity <laughs> for everyone involved yeah i still remember it. i remember the day when uh, we were just talking about the, a similar subject and uh you said something in the line of like uh, zoom is the best art school out there and i, I have to agree because it's like we jumped in into the deep waters uh without knowing how to swim and it's just like you know learn or die yeah. mm. But uh, let's let's jump. Let's look at some material. Let's look at some material. Yeah, we we picked a bunch of different different types of uh, images, and they're mostly different because uh, we, <laughs> for the longest time, we didn't have like a consistent way of, of doing things. So we just like shuffled around different tools and different methods. Uh, but I think this is this is a cool thing to start from because it's one of like their earliest stages in and starting to design a level, like doing thumbnails and like rough stuff after after getting a brief from the writers. Um, this is the doomed commercial area. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it's also like interesting because uh, in, in those early stages, like for example, like this, th this is what we ended up seeing in the game. Uh, that means that all of this was like cut away. Like initially, I, I was thinking like, yeah, you could go underground, and uh, there's like this dungeon crawling element. But uh, it was sort of like distracting from the from the focus of the story, and and Doom Doom commercial area already is is fairly like has a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is the thing we sort of like ran up against quite a lot, uh, especially earlier in the development where we just like over and over designed and like, mm -hmm. we just like, uh, we, I guess we, we had like an, a feeling of what might be like an appropriate video game level or how much stuff should be there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then like after the fact, kind of checking uh, what is appropriate uh, or like what's needed, uh, so mm -hmm. uh, cut stuff there. And like so, yeah. Like and and for example, this thing. This looks at uh, the top floors of uh, of the Doom commercial area, and uh, that's that one's a mix of uh, your drawings and and my attempts at at designing the thing. I think you had like a pretty pretty rough layout in place. And for like the bookstore, which was like this small area, like I, I I used the silhouette of the outside building, which was like fairly unique enough already and, and like interesting. Uh, but uh, I think the next image I have here is, oh, it's back to the basement. But the second floor has a similar concept, like similar level of like detail and uh, really, really overdone. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, look at this, it's just like such a juicy image. Mm -hmm. It's just like... Uh... I think I, I even tried to paint it afterwards, but like this this was unnecessary, so I, I stopped quickly and I just added it off to the modeler. And... Uh... Yeah, and, and of, of, of the different tunnels, I think there's an orb here that you can click on it, and it's like... Yeah, something has collapsed here. <laughs> it's like collapsed dreams of of a beginner level designer. <laughs> mm. Mm. But yeah, like like there, it's all of the whole area is like really dense. You get all, like, 
these these important story points like this thing is important this thing is important this thing is important like let's not talk about this thing oh this one here uh and like this one was supposed to be like this super super secret area and uh you can sort of like discover this uh hidden revolutionary era mm, like old bunker and uh that's that's what's left of the dungeon crawling essentially <laughs> mm. and then uh soon enough like we like i i found my own sweet spot which is just figuring out how people live like how regular people live like what what makes them special everybody's like the the protagonist in their own personal story and uh just thinking about the environment it's like if if you walk into a room like this isometric dollhouse view in that sense is really really interesting because like you really see a lot uh and uh you could zoom in and zoom out a little bit in in the game so finding that nice balance between like interesting details and and like general sort of clutter or lack of it uh it, it, it's like the most interesting like mini game that i created for myself yeah so uh, i feel like really one of the sort of like uh, superpowers that uh, that you really brought uh, to town is your sort of like uncanny uh attention to like domestic detail uh it's like a little sock left to drying somewhere or <laughs> like uh someone's like forgotten sweater or some a, a way a book is left uh, like on a windowsill or something like that uh it's like very like like um well observed moments uh, of, of of life basically i mean th this is in some sense this is where i came full circle and uh, took my sort of experience as a as a figurative and realistic um, painter because what what i used to do a lot is doing painting studies so it's just like you pop up an easel, you sit down, you find like a pleasing composition, uh, either plain air outside, or uh, I would do studies uh, in the rooms. And what I was interested in, like I, I wanted to, like as a painter, really get into this, like what does a room feel like when somebody has just left the room? Like try to capture something like um, the presence, some kind of yeah, human presence in, in, in a vacated room. Like, I, I don't know, like uh, a dumb example is uh, you step into a room and there's a cup of coffee or tea and it's still steaming. So, you, you know, in in films, you get like hunters go into the woods and find a piece of shit and just like chew on it. And like, this is still warm. Like, it's, it's a similar thing. Like There's wildlife here, but but the same thing, but in, in an urban environment, basically. Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, that's that's when it became fun and uh it was cool seeing how writers picked up on that as well. Cause sometimes uh, we'd get like really detailed briefs, and uh, but more often than not, it was just like this general, like this this character lives there. This is what they're like. Uh, yeah. And with this image, it's it's turning back the clock a little bit further. Uh, as you can see, like there's there's no mood in this one. This is this is just like a detailed drawing for the three D modeler to get some kind of exact rendering, too detailed uh, for for any any kind of good use. It's also it's it's on a grid. That's that's really bugging me right now. Like, uh... <laughs> yeah, isometric like invites you to draw on a grid. Uh, it is one of the uh, most important uh, things to to keep in mind when you're kind of like working in isometric is to like try and break out of that like uh, mm -hmm. box box drawing uh, mindset. Like, this is, I guess, um, especially uh, relevant for us was like when we were doing the silhouettes of the rooms and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. It was very important not to get um, uh, boxed in. Uh, like boxes are like prison design. Like uh, you want your um, uh, if a place is alive, it needs to be shaped in a lively kind of way mm -hmm. but it, it took the longest time to figure this out that we don't have to stick to a grid <laughs> it's uh like naturally what we noticed at some point was that this uh 
sort of like beehive logic because the like the camera looks from here like the the player looks at it from this angle mm -hmm. so like this is these are the sides that show the most information but it doesn't mean that like you can't like in the interior maps you you use these to work with the silhouette but uh but yeah like the stuff doesn't have to be under at, at these angles like this one and this one and this one like we could have built a pier that goes like this or like curved or like something something like very very much more interesting yeah i went to the water uh, i wonder uh, can we take a moment and then find sort of like a, a zoomed out uh, image of uh, martin asks the um the hexagon patterns thing that you just pointed out mm -hmm. hexa or octagon uh, is actually like got an interesting uh, like uh, design principle that we discovered about uh, isometric environments in general. Mm -hmm. Keep talking. I'm gonna I'm gonna find this. So um, I guess yeah, it's it's uh, because of the nature of of like the isometric angle and the fact that you see the far away uh, you know the landscape turns into a wall on the on the distant uh, sides. Um, this uh, has these inherent to the nature of it, uh, it suggests uh, creating these like little pockets of um, pockets of environment, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, where you want to sort of like maximize the amount of verticality and and flat area that you have, and this just like forces like suggests it to become the shape. And if you like look at the uh, the world map for uh, this Coliseum, uh, then you can like almost like eerily perfectly you can superimpose or lay over this like hexagon grid and you can see that all the sort of like uh, hub areas that you stay at or visit mm -hmm. uh, they are they all sort of like conform to it okay i found it here you go so like uh if we look at like this area these are rough and then this one corresponding to it I like the to... same thing oh, hexagon. <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> Minor octagons, are they? Octagons. I don't know. Whatever they have this <laughs> <laughs> that geometric uh, shaping in general. A polygon. <clears throat> so yeah. Mm. So you know, a very loose illustration of of uh, how this concept uh, mm -hmm. it's like pops up, like uh, because of the I guess the nature of how isometric uh, mm -hmm. suggests that you display things. So essentially, like these these sites are most active and here you can display less information and this area mostly works as a, as a silhouette like this one is a good example where the the bombed out uh part of the architecture is deliberately just al almost like a black silhouette essentially and uh and the action takes place inside this space so Sometimes they overlap a little bit, but like the, these became these active areas uh, where the character would end up. Same thing, like you'd get a similar thing here in the in the fishing village, or here on the coast, uh, like this area over here, then over here, you know. And it, it, yeah. it was really interesting to like realize that at some. Yeah, point. this is something we discovered like after the fact when we were sort of like taking a moment to study mm -hmm. the, the work done. Uh, it, it wasn't designed with this in mind or anything, but now it's sort of like a tool we have that we can keep in mind uh, designing uh, future environments. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess it was like unintentional. I, I, I don't know if it's if it's a good thing in in the long run, but uh, it does seem like it uh, sort of sort of worked out. Mm -hmm. What happens if I close this one up? Okay, I have the lines there. That is a really grey image. This one? Oh, do yeah. We have, do we have a colourful one? Of this one? 
the just like a next colorful image next colorful image uh it's this one <laughs> huh? this one's like again like uh you get the similar like the shape. political message it's a political message very very topical mm. but this is interesting because uh we went back to change this one because er early on this was just just like a side street like a passageway like the character would run through this to get into the back courtyard of, of that area but then, uh, yeah, this this wall became a thing. It didn't have a mural on it, though. Yeah, the, the wall. So the story of the wall is kind of, kind of funny. This was just like a liminal space uh, to get from like the waterfront area to the back of the, the courtyard. Mm -hmm. But then uh, there was just like this wall there. It just like happened to be in like kind of like the concept of the 3D. It was just this clean, clean like big... Uh, surface uh, that when I like painted the backgrounds, you know, just like uh, I had uh, uh, a, a rare clean canvas where I could just like put some like uh, yeah, juicy brush strokes <laughs> and, and color and uh, stuff down and just like really enjoy like putting together like almost like an abstract uh, painting in a way. Mm -hmm. and then basically like one day like Robert saw this in the game, it was just like, dude, <laughs> this wall. <laughs> yeah, and like the like whole piece of side content just grew out of this thing. Yeah, it's, it's owned like Art Cop questline and stuff. <laughs> but w yeah. what it meant was like, before he, there was this, I don't know, just circular, boring old chimney, coal stack. And uh, and we needed space here for, for our characters. Uh, so this this was like the practical consideration. But like I, I took this opportunity to just take this uh, chimney that was literally just rectangles arrayed in a circle and arrayed vertically to create this vertical pipe made out of like little bricks and uh, lean heavily into environmental storytelling where where this thing would like look interesting like the the silhouette is slightly more interesting like there's stuff going on here like down to like the little little uneven like things and like negative space where you can like see the character run through underneath and uh and also like there's this ladder here uh this bricks with different patterns different colors weathering like these steel bands holding holding this thing together from collapsing and uh like different kinds of stones down here uh some concrete patching up uh so yeah like at really making this thing in, 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 into something more interesting mm -hmm. mm. to sort of like uh, create the necessary interest points uh so if we actually do like make you stop at the mm -hmm. wall and look at it then uh, uh the other stuff also helps to carry it and not just the wall itself yeah it supports uh, it and so yeah mm -hmm. but just in general like um in, in this sort of like isometric game the where uh, your uh, depth perception is always a little bit challenged because perspective doesn't converge and everything is sort of flattened into this plane. Mm -hmm. uh, then these uh, foreground silhouettes uh, get a heightened importance in general uh, to make sure that they're sort of like interesting and really covering up like random aspects of, of uh, random parts. Um, mm -hmm. The character that's kind of like walking uh, behind them, it just brings everything to to life uh, so much more mm -hmm. and like also lighting is extremely important so in this next image um, th this is actually like uh, personally for me an, an important concept because uh, this this was not supposed to be in the game this, this was my Sunday uh, like Sunday project or weekend project where I just wanted to create something something in this disco vein and uh, was playing around with the silhouette somewhat unsuccessfully like these these tiny lampshades like they don't really uh, do what I intended but there's like pipes in the foreground and like small details and smaller and bigger bigger details like the character moves behind them and uh, I created a mock-up of this in in blender and played around with the like um, lighting just just to get it to look interesting 
in the end, you know, it, it's, you still ended up painting the whole thing. I wanted to do it myself just to prove to myself that I can. But uh, I ran out of time. Probably, like, I had to finish painting the 200-something-something uh, inventory icons. So, yeah, that's, that's the story of this one. But, like, there's also the, the thing, like, this is part of the Capeside Apartments, which... Uh, was supposed to be just like two or three rooms and uh i went a little crazy with this <laughs> and uh, just writers had to write so much more content uh in the end i think it's it's not a bad thing but uh you know feature bloat content bloat something something like that not we, we always we ended up thing. we we sort of like uh it wasn't planned in such a way but we ended up uh designing a world where pretty much every door that you see you can mm -hmm. go into mm -hmm. and uh when we sort of became aware of this uh and then realized our own sort of like obsession of like uh making sure that you can go behind every door mm -hmm. uh sort of where the um uh, the, the one more door that you cannot open <laughs> why this became very important for us as well mm -hmm. to make sure the that... game there has to be the one door that you can't enter because sometimes things are like this in life. <laughs> mm. Okay, this image, the mm. Ruby, Ruby's hideout, the instigator's lair. Another interesting map. Like, uh, by this point, I, I, I had gotten really ambitious as, as, as a sort of like exploration designer and was considering all these different different sort of like pacing and uh, things you could do in an area. Like what, what made this area special, I guess, was like the, the lighting. Because it's uh, yeah, underneath. Yeah, the light can get through in uh, from like the boardwalk above. The ceiling is like this, like just planks. Mm -hmm. And like at, at every step, uh, you're sort of aware that you've been walking across this thing like tens, if not hundreds of times. <laughs> this is uh, a very, very important area uh, relating to the story. But like, again, I, I think the design brief was like, we needed, we needed this and uh, maybe a little bit of this, but uh, the, the whole like multiple passageways, a hidden area, and and all that stuff was uh, artistic liberty, <laughs> mm -hmm. and like the the character enters this area by going onto the rooftop of of another building of this huge building next to the boardwalk, uh, and initially I think the character was supposed to end up here, but again thinking about pacing, I added this little nod towards like one of my favorite games, Fallout. Uh, because it was just like this vault 15 moment where you where you descend into the vault for the first time like you got to get a rope for the elevator and you go down and then you have to go down further and there's some like collapsed passageways so mm -hmm. like i almost wanted to make the blackness here into that fallout one blue mm -hmm. so it was a really cool one to to work on mm -hmm. So what strikes me about this image is uh, the sort of level of shorthand that we uh, ventured to use uh, in our design. It's like we're a fairly small team and, and uh, we, we all sort of like uh, know each other pretty well. And uh, like we can communicate in like, you know, grunts and, and huffs and puffs and uh, like uh, most of the concept art of the game was like done on like napkins, like really quick ballpoint pen, like uh, next to lunch or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, so especially compared to the very gray, uh, rendering of, of, the this thing, yeah, like super detailed drawing Then here it's like almost like no detail, uh, like little, like scaffold, um, uh, scaffolding. No, I think, uh, posts, yeah. the holding up the board boardwalk, mm -hmm. give the boardwalk up and stuff. There's almost like this Hanna Barbera esque like cartoon, <laughs> cartoony stylization. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, I remember we, we, uh, got into trouble with this as, uh, uh, I mean, our, our modeler was uh, used to getting handed stuff like this. And, well, I mean, uh, not not like completely at always, but with this one, we like uh, 
Uh, you, you, Gaspar, with this when you crossed the line. <laughs> and then, uh, I remember, like, Rauna looked at it and was like, dude, what is, like, what am I, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think I overestimated, like, the mind-reading abilities uh with with this one because like often it was like like you said it's just like which are like grunts and hmm and uh like just putting in a few marks here uh and and that other one would like understand what we're talking about but this one i guess was like a, a little too abstract it is it's a rough thing <laughs> hmm. but it kind of yeah, I, I liked it because uh, again, for me, it, like it conveyed the mood, and it was the closest thing to uh, when I put it into the engine just to walk around on this on this plane. It it it, it was the closest thing to actually the the final result, sort of. So in my eyes, it was like a really good shorthand image came together sort of quickly. It was like easy to iterate on. Mm. Uh, lessons learned in how to uh, communicate and, uh, and how how the teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this image is um, is what our renderer spits out. So we re we used a custom Blender render engine to uh, sort of create all these different maps of an area. This is this is Kuno's shack, Kuno's throne room. And you get these, like uh, the height map. This is this is what tells the game engine basically like what's in front of, what's in front and what's, what's behind something. Like interesting bit of corporate espionage before we started like making the game, was trying to figure this out. Like how do you take a flat painting and put 3D characters on it and like make them stand behind a tree or something like that if, if the tree is painted into the background. It seemed impossible, but you know, math. It's math, yeah. Uh, uh, we, we like uh, got a lot of help in this because uh, in, in, from, from checking out um, the uh, development blog videos of uh, Pillars of Eternity. Mm -hmm. they went into like some details and uh, showed a little bit of like uh, behind the scenes stuff. So it was like just uh, uh, sitting together with our technical artist, uh, Sim Reidman, just like really studying it and thinking like, like classic case of, of the Soviets trying to like reverse engineer what the, uh, what, uh, what the United American States, uh, the Americans <laughs> have like American engineers have come up with. <laughs> mm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so we get like these uh, sort of like renders from Blender and then we can use them to uh, illuminate the scenes in the game in real time, put lights on it and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are also incredibly useful for me when I was uh, painting over them. Uh, the very colorful one in the top right corner, for instance, is the clown pass. known as the clown pass. <laughs> Uh, which is like every object has its own randomly generated color. So it's very easy for you to in Photoshop kind of like select this color range, and then you like you mask it out. So, you know, it's very easy to uh, color in the lines. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to pay attention to it. The computer does all the hard work for you. And mm -hmm. it also allows you to be like really expressive with just like a big splash of paint or a big brush stroke that sort of unifies some like smaller details. Yeah, so it allows you to do this like video game art using some techniques that uh, you might have like uh, used in art school where you tape up your canvas to get like uh, safe uh, covered areas so you can really like fuck around with a certain mm -hmm. type of like paint or texture or something. Mm -hmm. and it's the same principle, but like applied to the background art in the game. Mm -hmm. But there's also uh, a folly of youth here uh, when we were all but young men dreaming. Uh, in this one? Yeah, the, the photo textures. Like for various reasons, we really thought that we needed to texture the se texture the scenes uh, beforehand in the beginning. Yeah, we had like all sorts of experimenting yeah. with like Substance Painter and Quixel and 3D Coat and like trying out like what works best. And in the end, it was just like flat color. <laughs> flat color works the best. Yeah, uh, it was a very pain like painful slow lesson to to learn. And then we did these textured uh, maps for like 
like quite a few environments before we stop doing them. Mm -hmm. But what happens is it just, you have to paint over everything. Uh, you just have to paint out the photo texture and it doesn't really give you anything. It doesn't really like do anything. Mm -hmm. It's just like more like annoying kind of like work. And uh... I mean, what was really annoying was like going back after the fact uh, to remove like the the bump textures from the normal maps. Oh my God, that was like, and, and it, it was difficult to spot them. So sometimes like a year after an area was finished and going like, ah, there's some noisy yeah. stuff still in here. Sometimes in the game, you can still see this somewhere. I'm sure if you shine a flashlight on something and the surface is like very gravelly Grainy. looking. Yeah. And that's just like a bump map that we didn't take out. I think we got most of it out, but yeah, you, you might be right. Like there, there might be some places. <laughs> old old uh, normal maps in there but yeah like it, it was it was like quadruple difficult because what it meant was uh, we had to like render it again and uh, and sometimes we'd make like small changes or uh, the server would blow up and uh, fun times mm -hmm. um, <laughs> This is this is the thing that the engine sees, so so to speak, like every square represents a four K resolution um, square from the game. Although this is, I think this is the virtual textures. Yeah, this thing. is the virtual how virtual texture packs uh, mm -hmm. images together. So it's sort of like the, all the painted, all the work painted gets like split up by the computer into this big sheet of puzzle sheet basically mm -hmm. so as you're walking around uh, the game the computer is sort of like puffing and puffing and running up ahead of you and trying to like do, 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 mm -hmm. put the image together uh, from uh, these kinds of pieces so it's like just outside the camera range it's it's streaming in data and like assembling the world outside which is uh, conceptually holds with uh, with elysium which is awesome <laughs> uh Okay, but I, th I think we got to this uh, this part where we can sort of talk a little bit about like the genesis of of every individual map. Mm. This one is the underground reading room, which is like brand new content for the Final Cut version of the game. Um, I could ramble on, but uh, it was actually you that uh, did the concept for this. Yeah. So so. Uh... This was basically, yeah, concept that's by me as well. Mm, the top right one uh, there with the white uh, drawing on the black, this was sort of the first uh, thumbnail sketch for this area, trying to put on the, I guess, the, the bigger like symbols, ele elements, mm -hmm. and figure out the composition and the shape of the, the room and and uh, the thematic points or the little thematic inspirations that inform the design of this place. Mm -hmm. So what it's, uh, because um, what happens in the game is this is a, like an abandoned part of like a building where uh, the uh, sneaky communist students uh, come and uh, read their sneaky communist literature and uh, discuss mm. uh, discuss it and get into like petty fights and stuff. Uh, so the uh, visual language here is inspired by sort of like this uh, early 20th century Russian like futurist uh, constructivist uh, this stuff. Yeah, so this is Ilya Jasnik, uh, uh, my one of my favorite uh, artists whose work I, I, I keep coming back to and just like mesmerizing stuff. Mm, really like, you know, pure geometric shapes, uh, but uh, aligned into these uh, striking compositions that just like, as images, they're like wonderfully strong and really, really like, really impactful, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But so, I guess on the right one, you can kind of see the, uh, the, the the reliance on sort of like these rectangles, rectangular shapes, these squares and stuff, and then the and flanks and stuff. And this was uh, sort of mirrored intentionally in the uh, underground reading room, where the it's tarpaulin stuck. and uh, yeah, the scaffolding bits there, mm -hmm. which are sort of like abstractly floating in the air. The sort of sh shape language there is is all uh, in reference, mm -hmm. at least in my mind, in reference to. Uh, like Ilya Jasnik and the compositions of, of like the uh, early idealist uh, communists. Mm -hmm. mm. But then at the same time, of course, uh, you know, uh, whew, 
communism only is 0.000001% ever been built. It's like an, uh, a construction site uh, never to be finished, and like uh, abandoned. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, there's also the sort of like, as you're trying to build this like uh, improbable uh, structure, there is the gaping maw, the the, the whole uh, it's like the just like result of the you. shelling. Mm -hmm. uh, waiting for you to you know like uh, make one mistake, just like fuck up just a little bit, and you're gonna fall in, and they're never going to climb out of that again. Yeah, being an artist, this is is a precarious. Uh... Position. This is this is this is what it feels like to be an artist. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. Earlier, I I numbered like so. This was like your early thumbnail. Uh, no, this was this was already slightly more developed, and uh, like this is some kind of intermediary thing. Mm -hmm. Just trying to get like a little bit more clear of what the shapes are and what like the wall is and kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. but not really getting into like full concept artist mode yet. Yeah, but I was like uh, surprised that like this was pretty much the thing that you handed off uh, to to our modeler. So, and so the next thing after seeing these doodles, it was uh, I, I saw this thing. So, like a test render uh, with the lighting and like the main elements of the thing, and uh, this is something that uh, I would do with you, and uh, this time. It, it was just reversed, like you sent me this thing, and uh, I, I would add notes. And uh, the way I do it is I would paint over it. So you can like sort of uh, blend between those two and like try to figure out what changed. <laughs> but what I was thinking about here was uh, like, yeah, using using the front front sides of the of the polygon so to speak like uh adding this scaffolding here and like using the adding adding some furniture and and some elements here that that could work uh, just as silhouettes and and also like making this area slightly more interesting like some variation here so again when, when the characters uh walk in like behind that thing it's sort of differentiate between what more clearly what's what's in front and what's behind mm -hmm. mm, and when you put lights in here like you have this multiple layers so you have like this stuff then you have like the boxes here there's some kind of shelf there's more scaffolding behind that and behind that the cloth and behind that the gaping maw so like it's it's like multiple things in front of each other, and uh, if the lighting is right, it uh, yeah it sort of circumvents the the lack of perspective of of this isometric sort of view. Mm -hmm. And here as well, like uh, this shape. <laughs> <laughs> so is that shape? Uh, but. Um, I would also add like notes. This this was something that I, I think I did on the bus, so hence hence the really wonky handwriting. Should make a font out of this, <laughs> mm, just for posterity's sake. Because uh, in, inside a studio, we could just show each other stuff and uh, explain what we were thinking about. And I really overdid it with the slightly more complex layered board action. Mm. But uh, enough of that stuff. Like, let's talk about painting. Um, so here's like an example of uh, how it's like to paint when you don't have photo textures underneath. Mm -hmm. You can just put down like almost like watercolor or like these uh, loose washes of of, um, of color information, and uh, um, this is sort of uh, used together with like a black and white, very like a gentle diffuse render of of the environment. So there's just like this ambient occlusion. It's basically an amb ambient occlusion render. So there's like a little bit of the drawing of the scene. Uh, so I could start paint, putting like color underneath it. And then it's just like you keep painting. You start like uh, you, get, you get more concrete with the shapes and, and uh, stuff. 
do more like you start differentiating things like doing a temperature shift between what is a wall and what is a, like a ground surface uh, bring in like texture stuff and then you just like keep going into like from bigger shapes to like smaller shapes as you like uh, start defining what is the specific uh, color of like objects and stuff but it's all like painted also in this um, very kind of like subjective style uh, really appropriate for the game and then uh, how you know our main character perceives the world and so and so that sometimes like it can be like, just like quite difficult to pick out what is the exact color of some object because uh, they aren't even like painted or that is not the thing that's being uh, really thought about mm -hmm. it's all about the sort of like the color temperature and the the overall kind of feel and how it like how the environment uh, comes together mm -hmm. i mean also like lighting affects this but uh, yeah, while we were talking, I was like blending in the different <laughs> different layers of paint yeah, like, as, it, as it progresses. But like the the final touches would be like these these like solid painterly brushstrokes, mm -hmm. like slightly more saturated color here and there. Like like this blue here really like brings it brings it together. Yeah, sure. it's all about that blue. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 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 an incredibly p uh, pleasant way to paint, where it's like uh, lean on the warm warms a little bit too much, and then in the very end you just put like a little bit of blue. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is the same thing. So from this, uh, to this. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. Mm. This is this is, so yeah. We we give you an overview of uh, how you how you can start with a sketch and end up with the finished map in in a game like Disco Elysium. Yeah. A so brief look of of uh, how the sausage is made. <laughs> Thank you for watching and uh, see you around. <laughs>